All set, David? Yeah. All right, David McCloskey. Thank you. Um, welcome to uh, my country, my place here called the Ish River Country. And uh, that's a map that we're working on in progress. And it's an exploration in bioregional geography. And um, this is with <laughs> the cartographer here, my collaborator, uh, Neil Allen of Benchmark Maps. Um, so I invite you to take a little bit different perspective on this whole place. When I say bioregional geography, I mean integrative, like cross-border, and in-depth, many, many levels, geology, climate, uh, flora, fauna, people, and the uh, experience of the place. And this is what the Ish River looks like, the experience of it. Um, there were other cultures and are other cultures still here. Um, so when we think about how we live here, um, it's instructive to uh, think about this. Uh, I did this slideshow last night and said, um, when do you think that picture was taken? 100 years ago? Five. In Bella Coola. This is not that long ago. This is... Um, Tulalip up by Everett, uh, hunt, uh, about the turn of the century. They're playing, um, not, it's not a potlatch, but it's a bone game called Lahal. Uh, you can still go to um, ceremonies and first salmon ceremonies at the Tulalip Preservation. Uh, that was the superabundance of this place. And because that was so superabundant and uh, Hygrated out like the um, forests, the ancient forests, the salmon. Uh, we have uh, a totem here. We have uh, the Lord of the Sea, uh, Orca, but it's in trouble. Maybe you heard about Taliqua last year, the mother Orca who carried her um, her calf for 21 days on her forehead. So, in order to uh, Imagine the place as a whole, or reimagine the place. In 1987, I made this map, the Ish River Bioregion. Well, actually, I didn't make this. This was 1985. This is the first image that, of the um, Inland Sea as a whole. The first image. And I didn't draw this. A group called Planet Drum. And we made, Marsh and I made this map for a conference in 1987 and named it Ish River. And the poet, Robert Sun, who wrote a book called Ish River, which is be beloved here, um, wrote, did the preface in his calligraphy. And then people pursued this, and especially a marine geographer at um, Western called Bert Weber, <laughs> he wanted to emphasize, hey, those waters are a whole, they flow together. So he stuck with it and petitioned uh, the two countries, we got a cross border, to say, hey, why don't we give a new overlay to all the inland Puget Sound, Strait of Georgia, Fraser, and um, uh, Juan de Fuca. So we made that map. Now, I don't know whether you've heard of Cascadia. It's fairly significant out here. And I made that map in 1987. And Neil and I made this map in 2015. So uh, this map is a companion to this. It's a subset of this where we are now. So it's really a story of the place where you are right now, kind of hidden. Um, when we made the Cascadia map, I didn't have any idea that it would have any effect. But Esri liked it, and it became the cover of their map book in um, 2015. And um, they, they blew it up. That's 11 feet wide by 15 feet high was the banner at, uh, at the conference. So now we start with a place, and this will be a very abbreviated, rapid run through uh, the new map. And to locate you, there's the Cascadia map, and that's the Maiden of Deception Pass. And there's a whole story of how that people married with the salmon people under the sea. And that's her. So this is um, a summary of the um, new map we're making without any boundaries. Uh, here's a slope map. Um, and I especially want to draw your attention to how low all of 
Does everybody understand Puget Sound here where you are? You know where you are, Puget Sound, Strait of George, going out. And uh, then the ice fields up there, they're a very important part of this untold story of this place. So we go to Veg real quick. Uh, that's the headwaters of the Skagit River, and that's, that's, that's the totem tree of this region, the western red cedar, which is sacred to, to the natives and to everybody here. I tell you, we went through hell making these two countries. You try and get a geography map of the two <laughs> that makes sense. You try and get a climatology map that crosses the border that makes sense. You try and get a veg map. Forest. This is forest. We're talking about. So there's BC, and BC deserves the, at the top there. Then Neil printed out um, all the classes, and there were like I don't know four or five hundred classes to begin with, and um, BC has the most advanced biogeoclimatic bio mapping model in the world. It is a. It's fantastic. What does the U.S. have? Nothing. This map that you see of the U.S. part of it. I didn't come from the Forest Service. The Forest Service won't tell you how the forests in one uh, district connect to the other one. This was made by the USGS, the gap analysis. If you know about the gaps, where <laughs> you have one conservation area and that's about 5% of the land, and 95% is gap. So the question is, how do the critters cross those gaps? So then they finally started making these maps. So the long story short here is um, <sighs> translating these two uh, in, almost incommensurable systems is like moving between um, Mandarin into German into Coast Salish. It took me almost two years to create a common framework that would cross that border. And there's the summary of the framework. And here's, and we don't have time for all of this, but um, I made a new kind of legend, and Neil stuck with me. And what you need to understand about this region real quickly is the parallel sets of mountain ranges running north and south with alternating, with a, with a pattern of alternating windward and leeward sides. And there's not one windward side, there's about four. So where we are right now, so that would be Seattle and Vancouver. That would be the interior plateau. And those are the mountains, the ice fields, that play a significant role. So I, we created a new kind of legend. For the first time that I know of on a veg map like this, <coughs> because I had to um, decipher where all those veg formations were, like Sitka spruce and uh, western uh, red cedar and so on. We worked out the location, windward and leeward sides, and multiple sides, the elevations, the climatic regime, the uh, precip and temperature regimes for winter, the long season, and summer, the dry season. And then um, the legend tells you something I don't ever seen other than a veg legend tells you. It tells you species composition in the order of prevalence for both conifer and broadleafs by geographic area. And the example of that is at the bottom for um, where we are now. Uh, also created a new kind of bioregional palette following the axes, and this was, um, that's the coast out there. Where we are right now is in here, and that's the mountains going up. And that's what I gave to Daniel. <laughs> he said, what, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> um, early on in both the Cascadia and the, this map, I refused to use, to waste color for elevation. Ran into some <laughs> trouble with, with one of the mentors who said, oh, that's crazy. 
it's a waste for, for what we're doing here in bioregional geography. Um, color is used for vetch, which means that if you try to integrate all these factors, so for example, the intrinsic factor here of Sitka spruce, if you look at the needles, they're uh, blue. If you're in the climate, it's fog and, uh, and, and very chilly. So it's as, as if the atmosphere is blue. Ponderosa pine, cinnamon orange. Okay, so if you look at, try and look at all these factors, the intrinsic uh, of the species or the habitat, oh, what's that say up there? Geographic location, the climate there, elevations. Color then in a bioregional palette is uh, an expressive integrator. It gathers the whole place. So it's not arbitrary, but it's very expressive. That's the legend over there. Oops, and that's what was, that was Sika Spruce. <laughs> this is the lowlands. This is the montane. And that's the west slope. Here we will go into the in interior, and that's the uh, Fraser River and the Thompson River. And that's what the interior veg looks like. That's what the alpine looks like. And that's what the whole uh, veg system looks like. You notice there are no boundaries on that. I don't do um, fiat boundaries, political container space. So these are the native um, uh, tribes of this region going up into BC. And I said, well, let's do watersheds. Let's do watersheds as a prime natural address. And so that's what uh, we've created there. These are the ecoregions. If you remember real quickly, the west slope veg and the east slope veg, the interior slope, that's why we drew those boundaries where they are. They're not fiat boundaries. So, what we're trying to do is to create a series of uh, uh, nested ecologies, both uh, for ecological and cultural, and uh, call people home to the place, and then give them names. So there are the watersheds, like we're right now in the Puyallup watershed, mm -hmm. and then the Ish River ecoregion in Cascadia. The Cascadia one was from the Cascadia map. So in the remaining, that's the map, in the remaining time, the story of this place is the story of its formation, the dy dynamic of its formation, and that's ice. We're on the edge, you go down to Olympia, just a little bit south, that's where the ice stopped. So Neil created this uh, legend here. <clears throat> this is what it looked like. That's Max. That's actually the corner of Cascadia up in southeast Alaska, Mount Logan, 19,000. That's what uh, the ice fields that created the ice here. Here's the, <laughs> the shorthand version of this. Everybody knows, you gotta watch out what everybody knows. Everybody knows the ice carved this place. Where'd the ice come from? From the north. Uh, the Continental Glacier came down. No, it didn't. Continental Glacier never touched here. The Cordilleran Glacier, where we just saw a talk on the Cordilleran Glacier. Um, well, it, it came down from the, the Alpine Cirque. Cirque. I can go up mountains and look at the, the glaciers. No, they didn't. Alpine Cirque, like Mount Rainier, <coughs> right over there, is a colossus. It has 85 plus square kilometers of ice. More ice than all the contiguous U.S. put together. More ice than it's in a Glacier National Park. The glaciers from uh, Rainier barely even touched Puget Sound. They did not cause the ice. In fact, the lowland ice sheet blocked those alpine glaciers. Found out that um, people didn't know where the glaciers, the ice fields were, uh, because they had no names. So Neil and I had to go through GLIMS, the glacier data, and uh, figure out names for them. Uh, these ice fields created the ice sheet here. 
And um, this then, this image connects the ice fields to the veg. And what you see is we have these ice fields here because here's the windward side, the Pacific, the moist side, and then through that plateau back there, the Chilcotin Plateau, those colors are Arctic, subarctic. The Arctic, subarctic um, cold uh, reaches its farthest south location uh, right behind those Hamathco ice fields and so on. So we have the, the ice fields that form the lowland ice sheet here are the fifth largest ice, non-polar ice fields in the world. So we created this slope map. Um, the story here is, those are the ice fields. And because we have dams and because we have LIDAR, we can really trace the inscriptions of those uh, glaciers cutting the land. And so what you see is radiating out in all directions from those ice fields are these ice streams. And uh, some of them came, went north. There's a, I don't have time for it, but there should be a, an ice divide right up there. And so we decided to use arrows here to indicate the pulses. People don't understand, oh, that it's all just one big sheet. No, it comes down in pulses in ice streams. And um, this one shows that's the edge of the ice. And something else happens. Uh, when I set out to make the map, why, why would you have the interior Lillooet? Because the ice that carved out where we are right now on the eastern part of Puget Sound came from the Lillooet area, came down the Fraser and the Lillooet River from the interior. <clears throat> what also happened on the edge of the glacier, the margin of the glacier, is uh, a series of uh, meltwater channels. And they're enormous. That picture I just showed you back there was Little Sai and Big Sai, it's on I-90. Um, that was formed by an outburst from Glacial Lake Skykomish, 10 times the uh, contemporary flow of the Columbia River. So this shows um, the, just purely the meltwater channels. This is what it looks like all together, just down here south. It's a fjord land, the whole place is a fjord land. All the way over to Montana is a fjord land. This is Lake uh, uh, Chelan. What I had never known before is there's the North Cascades and the ice that formed Puget Sound came and curved down the Fraser and the Lillooet, but some of it came uh, off and... David, you have about two minutes. Two minutes. Lake Chelan. <laughs> About 1,200 feet deep, about 300 something below sea level. The fjord lakes are below sea level. And um, these, this is the last gasp of the Ish River glacier coming that way, and the last gasp of the Okanagan glacier. And they're like two giant ships shuddering in front of one another, and they stop at this place called the Narrows. Now, I've, got to, I've got to quit here, but everybody knows Puget Sound was carved by the Glacier, right? No, I'm sorry, it wasn't. You see that big bowl? Yes, from the, from the, uh, you can just see the bowl everywhere on a clear day here, from those mountains over here. That was carved out by the bowl. In front of the glacier, the last time it came down, it pushed out this prograding um, sediment, and that formed all these islands. Then the weight of the ice, 3,000 feet, thick here, just compacted that ice into this glacial till. It's just hellish to get through it. One minute. And um, so those are the what's called the flutes, like the hill I used to live on, Queen Anne in Seattle, uh, or Whidbey Island. 
<laughs> and it wasn't formed by the glacier either. But in every glacier, as they melt, <clears throat> there are these meltwater streams, this downbursting meltwater stream like you see there. And those, they think now, carved out the face of this place. So welcome to Ish River. I hope that helps you understand it.